men's Very game clear. is calling, apparently. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there is no, not a question, just a, just a comment. Um, I have two kids that are like teenage years, like mm -hmm. teenage years. I think that's fantastic. Thank you. I don't think they've seen this at school. I think they should. Thank you. So, I appreciate it. How do we get in touch with you? Or what, uh, <laughs> I was like, we can get a card to you. Okay, for thanks. sure. So the uh, care of the last presentation of the day before the senators, right? Um, Jason has uh, humbly at, at, I'm sorry, accepted to do this presentation for us. Jason Fleming is from Med Relief, one of the licensed producers. He's their director of human resources. He's an accomplished bilingual HR executive with a decade of varied HR experience. Prior to joining Med Relief, Jason was the director of human resources with the Seaboard Transport Group. Uh, Canada's largest transporter of petroleum and chemical products. In addition, Jason has provided HR consulting services to a number of organizations in various sectors, including municipal government, architecture, and nonprofit. He sits on the board of directors for Aboriginal Legal Services as well as the Canadian Freestyle Skiing Association. Jason possesses a BA from the University of Guelph, postgraduate certificate in HR management, and a certificate in HR law. He is a certified human resources leader with the Ontario Human Resources Professional Association. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for sticking around. Maybe one day Cola will tell me what I did to upset her to put me on at the same time as the Sims game and all that. Maybe. So uh, I appreciate the introduction, Cola. So I work with Med Relief. I'm the director of HR, as mentioned. But uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in right now is the some of the unique challenges that medical cannabis, as well as the upcoming rec cannabis market, is having on the workplace. So this is a very interesting topic to me. So I want to I want to talk about continuing education in prairie. So what we've heard the last couple of days is that this is a very new and dynamic industry. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of stakeholders, a lot of interested parties uh, in learning about the industry and learning how to start businesses, how to operate in this industry. But it's because it's so new, we really haven't seen a lot of time for formal educational programs to be fully developed and implemented. Um, I was speaking with some contacts at some colleges in Ontario, and they were sharing that it generally takes one to two years to develop a curriculum and launch it. And I think what's happening in this Canvas space is that because things are changing so quickly, it's very difficult to keep up with that. So as a result, we're seeing a lot of private organizations that are coming to market fairly quickly with some independent programs. I think there's a, a, a bit of a variation in terms of quality with some of these programs being offered. So uh, that's some of the things I want to talk about today. Um, and we look at some of the key stakeholders. You've got, we've got obviously the public, the general public and parents, very concerned about this. We've got uh, prospective employees who want to learn the skills to enter the industry, uh, as well as people who want to start businesses in this industry and they're trying to learn how that can be done. Uh, not to mention a lot of professions, tens of thousands of Canadians, hundreds of thousands of Canadians who will be interacting with cannabis at some point uh, through their professional activities, like police officers and physicians and pharmacists. So there's definitely a big need for training. So I want to look at the five primary categories that I've been able to gather uh, that exist today. So, the first uh, category is an established discipline that is heavily integrated into the cannabis space. Um, and when I think of these uh, examples, I'm thinking agriculture, operations management. Um, these are existing disciplines that, just due to the nature of the industry, highly relevant. Um, and if we look at some schools, the University of Guelph, I know there's some schools in Atlanta, Canada, they've really emphasized the agricultural piece. But then we get into some of the more interesting things. So we're seeing a big focus on employment uh, center education. So KPU, for example, in Vancouver is one of the first, I think, that had a course to, to really focus on preparing the workforce for cannabis uh, the industry. Um, but we're seeing uh, Community College in New Brunswick, 
Um, and what I was just hearing about earlier this week was that um, the AASP has an OSAP approved course that is focused on, again, employment in the cannabis industry, geared towards more or less uh, licensed producers. So things are happening fairly quickly. Um, we're just not seeing the level of formality through uh, you know, college and education, uh, or college and university education at this time. One of the other big categories is, is personal cultivation and entrepreneurship training. And I think in, along with, in, in alignment with this is consultants helping businesses uh, get approved for licenses. This is another bucket that, you know, very interesting. Um, some of the schools of the United States are really emphasizing on home grow operations. So although um, our laws have not really been clear on what that's going to look like, there's people already charging and they're kind of targeting the Canadian market for the courses that may or may not be relevant. And if we look at uh, profession-specific training, uh, this is something that we heard about earlier with um, Superintendent Johnson. Um, if we're looking at police and physicians, there's a lot of Canadians that are preparing for this legalization that are not entirely sure how this is going to work in terms of their employment environments and their specific jobs. So to elaborate on what uh, Superintendent Johnson was talking about with the Drug Recognition Expert course, in 2009, there was about 600 people with the certification. And in 2009, before we started talking about cannabis legalization, it was reported that the ideal number of people with the certification was going to be around 1,800. We're still at 600 today. So we're, I think, very much behind the ball in terms of preparing our police forces for this. Um, and I think the same goes with a lot of medical professionals and NHR professionals trying to deal with impairment in the workplace. Lastly, uh, the, you know, the other significant category, I think this, this conference is a good example of it, as well as the previous presenter, is the uh, public education, general industry education. Uh, I think this is really, really critical. Uh, we've seen some good studies come out from Deloitte. We've seen uh, great events like this. Uh, the only challenge is uh, it appears that some of this information is not making it to the mainstream. It's not making it to households. And what that's doing is it's creating a bit of ambiguity where there's still not a, a really general, generally accepted understanding of this marketplace and what this, uh, what the, the legislation is going to look like. So some of the major takeaways that I want to review is that uh, right now at this time, given the lack of established standards and um, some of the ambiguity, self-study is really critical. So I think uh, you know, I've learned the hard way of doing these presentations that as soon as you come up with a great presentation, a month and a half later, half of your content can be irrelevant. Uh, so I think keeping up to date with your research is really, really important because this is evolving so quickly. Uh, progress is being made. There's no question there. I know that there's um, a couple of major colleges in Ontario that are going to be launching a postgraduate certificate related to uh, cannabis, specifically working for licensed producers. Uh, however, it's happening very slowly. So in the absence of that, we're still dealing with a lot of independent um, institutions offering this training. And I think the third thing, and I spoke with Colette about this, is a, a need for national curriculum standards to ensure that the education that people are paying for and that the education that we're going to be using to prepare our future workplace is all based on the up-to-date legislation and, and compliance practices. So I know that the Cannabis Candidate Association is working hard to develop this. Until that's fully developed, we're in an environment where there's a, a wide range of courses, some of which uh, may not be entirely compliant. In terms of uh, some of the gaps, so I think again, when we look at all the professions that need to be prepared to, to deal with this change in marketplace and landscape, um, what I think a big frustration point for a lot of people has been is that the, these dates are being thrown around, like we all are aware of July of 2018, but a lot of professions are still waiting on exactly what that's gonna mean for them. Um, I know my father is a retired police officer, was speaking with me about this last week, and he was saying how frustrating it was for him when, you know, right before he retired, this came out, and you had tens of thousands of police officers who had absolutely no idea what the plan was going to be for, you know, impaired driving. So I think we're playing catch-up, 
not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it does put a lot of pressure on us in the short term to ensure everyone is prepared. Um, I think HR professionals is a perfect example of this. Um, you know, we've got uh, some good presentations today from some lawyers, but it's still not entirely clear what this means for people who are not in safety sensitive positions versus those who are in safety sensitive positions. Um, we haven't established a, an exact science yet in terms of how those are going to be regulated. So career opportunities in the cannabis industry. So this is a this is an exploding industry, and if you start to Google cannabis jobs or you start looking at search marijuana or cannabis on Indeed or on LinkedIn, um, a couple of years ago you were not finding anything. Now there's there's sometimes dozens of jobs, and what I find interesting is the the range of jobs are is, is huge. There's there's chief executive officers, there's trimmers, and then we're seeing a lot of more mainstream traditional jobs like folks in IT and accounting and finance, uh, as these companies have grown, they need to bring on board the more traditional skill sets. So, you know, if I look at just in our organization, you know, we're investing in customer service, uh, technology, legal, accounting, marketing, and I know a lot of the other LPs are doing the same thing. Uh, I think a couple of, there's a few professions like growers, anything related to agriculture, you know, those roles have been around since day one but the other roles are becoming more and more focused on mainstream skill sets. Um, one of the interesting things as well is because everyone's ramping up production, uh, we're seeing a big stimulation in some local economies in terms of um, job creation for tradespeople, uh, cleaners, engineers. We're building a big facility in Bradford, Ontario right now, and at one point we have over 100 tradespeople on any given day working at that site. And these are people who have never done anything like this in their life, electricians and sheet metal workers. And everyone's just kind of going with the flow, but um, we're definitely seeing an emphasis on the, uh, the trades work as well. So strategies for securing employment in the industry. So there's a lot of well-documented strategies on securing employment period, but in this industry in particular, I think there's three that really jump out for me. Uh, I think networking in this space is more important than any other industry because a lot of the jobs that are being done right now have never been done before. It's not about what you know, it's about who you know and how well you are at marketing yourself. Um, events like this are great, but I think LinkedIn is a great tool and um, word of mouth as well has gone a long way. A lot of the roles we're filling in MedRelief have come from pre-existing relationships. Research is also very important. So. You know, a lot of traditional jobs, and I'll give marketing as an example, um, you know, these are jobs that are, are generally speaking fairly predictable, but because of the restrictions that exist in this industry, when you're preparing for an interview or a meeting to work for a licensed producer, you've got to do a lot of homework to make sure that you're able to actually speak to what you can do for the organization. Because when we just hired our marketing manager, I would say 80% of the candidates didn't get past the first interview because they hadn't even done, even done that basic research to understand what that legislation was restricting. So I think research is also very critical. And uh, the last thing is, you know, don't be afraid to create your own job. When you're working for LPs, again, there's no blueprint, blueprint for this. So it's fairly easy to make a case for creating jobs. And some of the people that work in our organization within the last six months, we've created probably four or five really, really cool jobs because they did a really good job of lobbying internally to say this is something we need. So some important considerations when entering the industry. I think the first one that I've learned is having a very clear expectation or a very clear explanation to share with your elderly relatives. This is not an easy thing to explain to people in their 70s and 80s that you're not working in the cannabis industry. I know both my grandmothers are in their 80s and it took about 45 minutes of explaining that what I was doing was legal. So be prepared to answer that question with your extended family and friends. Um, I think another misconception too is people think that this industry is very laid back and I think in reality because of the front pace that a lot of companies are growing at, it's not a nine to five. There's a lot of work to be done. There's a, a lot of late nights and early mornings. And if you're working on the cultivation side, um, something we tell a lot of our new hires, plants do not care about your plants. So 
figure ahead, but those is just if it's five o'clock and you think you're going home and there's more work to be done, that's not happening. So it's not the cushy job that a lot of people maybe would anticipate that it would be. Uh, in terms of what it's like to work for an LP, well, I've been here for less than a year, but I can say that uh, it's been a really, really great experience for me. Um, I can't picture myself working in another industry. Um, but there's a term that I read in a book uh, last week that the Navy SEALs use called VUCA. Does anybody know what VUCA stands for? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It's, it's basically 20, or seven VUCA in this industry right now. Because of the growth, because of the regulations, because of the fierce competition, very intense place to work. Um, people are great and everyone is very friendly with one another, but uh, it is definitely something you have to be flexible to do. Um, a couple of other points. So I think there's also a lot of opportunities to innovate. So this is not a job where you're going to be hired to just kind of execute an existing job description, um, you know, five days a week and kind of punch in, punch out. You will be expected at every level of the organization to solve problems and to come up with solutions to new problems that maybe you've never encountered before. So I think it's really important to be outspoken and to be comfortable sharing your ideas. Uh, job titles also don't mean anything. When I came in as a director of HR, I didn't realize that I would be dealing with tradespeople on a construction site. Didn't think that I would have to be going and helping buy wood to build fences on a roof of a row operation. But it's something we have to do. Everybody's on the same team. These are still small organizations, and uh, you can basically do whatever needs to be done on any given day. So I'm going to wrap up with just a couple of points. Um, so back to education. I think that uh, we can build some really, really good programs in this industry. I think we have enough knowledgeable people uh, that as long as our um, educational institutions are willing to partner with the experts in the industry and the licensed producers will be hiring people, um, I think we can create really, really effective programs that would be really value for people who are paying money to go to them and ensure that the workforce is competent and qualified. Um, and uh, regarding careers, it is an amazing industry to work in. Um, I think the, the one thing people need to remember is that it's a non-traditional industry. So traditional approaches to career planning and uh, job search won't apply necessarily in this space. So be prepared to have that element of creativity in your job search. That's it. That's all I wanted to share. I'm trying to give you that high level of experience. Thank you. as far as wages go, or compensation goes for the more professional level jobs? Like, are you paying as much for an IT admin as the government would, or as another kind of corporation would? What's the salary? That's a great rate? question. I think every organization is a little different the way you set your compensation strategy. Um, our organization operates in the GTA, so we have to at least, at least match the market. Um, I think if we were in some more remote, remote isolated areas, you have the ability to maybe uh, pay not as, as highly, but we're competing with uh, law firms, we're competing with like in a lot of the big organizations in the country. So I think in some cases we've actually had to pay a bit more because some folks are, are seeing a perceived risk in entering kind of a, a bit of an ambiguous industry. So I think we're at least matching and sometimes we're having to kind of pay a little bit more in order to uh, have people take that, that make that career move. Thanks for the question. Thanks for asking the question so I don't feel bad up here. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we've learned a lot of things that uh, are going to be successful in the future when we go across the country. I really appreciate uh, your commitment to staying to the end of it all. Uh, and I hope we've been able to share some information. And uh, we, we're going to continue doing this every year and in different locations. Uh, so to try and get 
as many Canadians as possible to learn more about cannabis. And I really appreciate you being here, and thank you so much. The exhibits will be open for another 20, 30 minutes. I think everybody wants the senators. I wish I had known this before. <laughs>